Some of you still stayed here to listen to me. Um, yeah. um, I will talk about the optimal dynamical decoherence control. So in the, in the context of a quantum error correction, this is a dynamical and active way to reduce the error per qubit so that hopefully it will be below the infamous uh, threshold. So uh, don't look for any codes or stabilizers. You won't find them. Uh, just the dynamical uh, decoherence control. So this is joint work with uh, Gershon Kuritsky and Daniel Ridar. Um, and so this is the outline. I wanted to zap you with all the equations from the start, so by the time I get to the result, it will fade out. Um, so these are all the most complex equations you'll find. Everything else is much easier. I will start by uh, introducing the universal dynamical decoherence control formalism, which results in a universal formula for the decoherence rate, which is the, uh, the, the spectral overlap of the noise and the modulation. I'll talk a lot about this. Then I'll do a brief uh, mathematical interlude of uh, introducing, uh, uh, doing a brief overview of the calculus of variations, which I'll then use to derive an analytical equation for the optimal modulation in order to decrease the decoherence. And then I'll present some uh, numerical results which will compare the optimal modulation to the bang-bang uh, or dynamical decoupling control, and I'll end with conclusion. <coughs> So first, I want to anchor this uh, theoretical talk by uh, uh, this, uh, saying something about the physical system that I, I'm considering. So let's talk about some decoherence mechanisms. So for example, in the ion trap, where it, uh, the Dave Weinland uh, talked about, so you have the internal uh, levels of the ions uh, as a qubit, and they can couple to vibrational uh, to, to other uh, uh, modes of the trap, uh, which uh, results in decoherence, and also some uh, magnetic fluctuation, which results in dephasing. Also, if you have a cold atom in an optical lattice, again, the qubit is, a, is a in the internal levels, but it can couple to vibrational levels, the vibrational modes of the trap, and thus decohere, and also an ion in a cavity, the same thing as the others. So let's move to the Hamiltonian formalism. It's fairly simple. This is a simple example. So we have a two-level system uh, with an energy separation of omega a. We have a bath of uh, zero temperature harmonic oscillators. And then the excited state is coupled to the, uh, the bath modes. So this will result in a decay, or what is known to you as a damping channel, which results in the initial excited state will go to the ground state. In order to, to control this, we use an AC Stark shift modulation, which results in a time-dependent change, effective time-dependent change of the energy separation. So the question is, how can this time-dependent uh, AC Stark modulation can, re can uh, benefit you and can combat this decoherence? So the fidelity, it can be easily shown that the fidelity of an initial excited state, so if you start for an initial, uh, initial excited state, the fidelity as a function of time is given in this form, where R is the average modified decoherence rate, and is given by uh, these uh, terms. This one is the reservoir response function, which is just the, 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 the function of the correlation of the bath modes. And this is the energy, uh, the phase modulation. Uh, this equation looks complicated, but if you move to the frequency domain, it becomes much more uh, understandable. So this is the decoherence rate, and this is the, the same thing in the frequency domain, where now G is the Fourier transform of this one, and it seems simply the system bath coupling spectrum, which is simply the, uh, the, the density of modes times the, the coupling strength to each one of the modes. And this is the spectral modulation intensity, Notice, however, this is, this is not a simple uh, Fourier transform of the modulation, because if we have the modulation, remember the AC Stark shift in the phase, uh, in the phase modulation. Sorry that it's cut a little bit. So this is uh, the phase modulation. Uh, you take the, Fourier, the finite time Fourier transform of it and the intensity of it. So this is the spectral modulation intensity. I'll talk a little bit about this later on. So now, as you can see, the decoherence, decoherence rate is simply the spectral overlap of these two functions. And just to check, ah, it's cut. Um, uh, for the case of no modulation, so we have no AC Stark shift, the, uh, the, deco the, the modulation function is one, the spectral modulation intensity is a delta function, and we cover their known golden rule somewhere below here. So now, just to convince you that the word universal is uh, appropriate, 
Uh, I will talk a little bit about more extensions to other more complicated stuff and see that uh, they're all the results in the same decoherence formalism. Uh, I will not go into details of all of the extensions, but I've given uh, uh, references to each one of the extensions I'm going to talk about if anyone is interested in the details. So we have shown that uh, a, a decay or damping channel due to finite temperature bath coupling and also proper dephasing, which is a dephasing channel, results in the same uh, modified Bloch equations and the same uh, decoherence rates for both of, these, uh, the, both of these scenarios. So this is a universal formula for the dephasing rate and also the decoherence rate. We've also extended this, this uh, formalism to multi qubit entanglement preservation. And we have showed how a local modulation can impose symmetry that will support a dynamic, uh, a decoherence-free subspace. So, for example, if you have two qubit, two qubits, uh, uh, by local modulation you can eliminate the, the inter-particle inter decoherence and equate the intra-particle uh, decoherence, and then it, this can result uh, by using a modulation on n qubits. You can it can sustain an n qubit uh, DFS. We have also started working on uh, uh, prevention of entanglement, what is known as entanglement sudden death, and also its resuscitation. This is work in progress, where we have shown that again, using, by using local modulation on the two qubits, you can actually, after entanglement has died already, it can uh, rise again back from life and, uh, and, uh, and uh, appear again after it has already been dead, simply by using the appropriate modulation. And we have also shown that uh, this, uh, this uh, formalism is good for the dephasing control during quantum computation, which is really a big problem in a lot of uh, systems. And uh, we have shown that uh, by actively controlling all the degrees of freedom in the system and not just optimizing the gate, uh, the gate sequence, but also other degrees of freedoms, the gate fidelity itself can be greatly improved even though the gate pulses, the gate sequence is, uh, is longer. So all of these uh, extensions uh, result in the end in the same uh, f uh, uh, decoherence rate formalism. Uh, so this is a universal dynamical decoherence control formalism. But up until now, this just, uh, just suggests which uh, modulation to use. And now we wanted to go one step beyond and do the optimal modulation. So I'll uh, first do a mat brief mathematical uh, interlude and uh, this have a brief overview of the calculus of variation. So if you want to minimize a uh, functional with some constraint, you have to follow the following procedure. First, you have to solve the Euler Lagrange equation, where this is a Lagrange multiplier with some boundary conditions. You get a solution dependent on the Lagrange multiplier. You insert the solution to the constraint uh, and get the relation between the Lagrange multiplier and the constraint. And then you reinsert it and you get the solution as a function of the constraint. So we're going to use this in order to find the optimal modulation. So what we want is we want to minimize the average modified decoherence rate. And we have an energy constraint on the, on the modulation itself. So just to remind you, again, we're doing for in the damping channels, uh, we're doing an AC Stark shift modulation. And I haven't shown you, but uh, we have shown that uh, for the dephasing channel, which we have a random fluctuation in the energy level, the appropriate modulation is a resonant field, a time-dependent resonant field, and which also results in a phase modulation. So using these notations, where omega naught is the resonance of the bath, uh, phi is the accumulated phase of the modulation and delta is the detuning. We came to this Euler-Lagrange uh, equation uh, where Z is a functional of the modulation, fairly simple functional, and these are the boundary conditions. Uh, phi of uh, the time zero is uh, um, uh, zero by definition, and what this boundary condition means is that we have a switch on modulation, which means that we start from zero modulation and then we switch it on, so a constant modulation throughout the whole proce uh, procedure is not uh, admissible. You have to start from zero and then uh, uh, climb to the modulation that you want. So following the procedure, we have this uh, Euler Lagrange equation. We put it in the constraint, and we arrive at a fairly, fairly complicated, but this is a single equation for the optimal modulation that you have. So let's uh, summarize this procedure. Uh, you are given the, uh, the noise, uh, so the reservoir res uh, response function by nature, not the journal, the mother. 
and, uh, and then we plug it in into this, uh, this, uh, um, this function. And we can solve this function numerically by an iterative process. You insert uh, a guess which, which fulfills the boundary condition and the constraint. You solve the equation. You reinsert the, the solution into the right-hand side and continue until you, you um, converge. So to, in the numerical result, I will want to compare it to the regular bang-bang or a dynamical decoupling formalism, which was a, a excellently introduced by Lorenza. Uh, so this is a simple bang-bang uh, by pi pole sequence, and this is the, the modulation inten intensity spectrum. So again, this is not the Fourier transform. To get from here to here, you have to integrate it, put it in the exponent, do a finite time Fourier transform, and to the intensity. So it's not a simple Fourier transform of the modulation. Actually, this is the reason for all the, calcul the, all the, uh, all the calculations are really complicated because in the, in, the f in the frequency domain, everything is simple, but to get from the time domain to the frequency domain, it's not a simple uh, Fourier transform of the modulation because we're using uh, uh, phase modulation. So as you can see in the frequency domain, the, uh, the bang bang or the, or the dynamical decoupling results in two peaks which become more distant as the separation uh, between the, the pulses becomes uh, de decreases. And for example, if we have this uh, uh, coupling spectrum with a width that is proportional to one over the correlation time of the bath, then you arrive at the regular uh, dynamical decoupling condition, which means that the, the distance between two, uh, two uh, uh, pulses should be uh, uh, smaller than the correlation time. If this condition is fulfilled, then the, the, the decoherence rate goes to zero. However, you must uh, understand that this, uh, this the, uh, bang bang or dynamical decoupling pulses does not take into account the fine detail of the of the of the reservoir uh, coupling spectrum. Uh, it is the same no matter what the, the, the spectrum is. So the question is, what happens if you have fine structure in the reservoir uh, spectrum, or if you don't have enough power to go to this dynamical decoupling uh, condition? So now I'll present some results. First, I'll introduce the one over F noise, which in our, uh, it is ubiquitous in uh, almost all of the systems. And in our formalism, simply that this G function is one over omega. So this axis is the, the energy. So how much energy we invest in the modulation. And this is the relative uh, uh, decoherence rate compared to uh, no modulation at all. So one is no modulation at all. This is the bang bang uh, uh, um, uh, decoherence improvement. And this is the optimal improvement. And as you can see, it's, uh, the optimal improvement is much better. The question is why. So we have to go to, the, uh, ah, first of all, it looks like a, only a mild improvement. But actually, this decoherence rate is in the exponent. So in the fidelity, this improvement is very, very large. So in order to understand it, we have to go to the frequency domain. So we have a 1 over f noise. This is the red line here. In the bang bang, we have two peaks where one goes to negative frequencies and one goes to positive frequencies. So uh, the reason improvement is you invest more energy, but the, the left peak is detrimental because it goes to lower frequencies, which has a higher, uh, higher de a coupling and results in higher decoherence. The optimal modulation, on the other hand, is chirped in this way in order to go to higher and higher frequencies as it, as, as it can with the given energy constraint. So this is the pulse how the pulse looks like. Again, this is not the Fourier transform of this one. You have to go to a lengthy operation to, to go. This is the Fourier transform of this. So in this uh, simple, actually, in the formalism, it's a very simple uh, uh, example. So this is the, the optimal pulse shape, and this is its frequency, the uh, modulation in the spectrum. However, now we can go to much more complicated scenarios. For example, if you have a multi-peak spectrum with, uh, let's say, several resonances in the bath coupling, uh, as you can see, the, the bang bang is completely arbitrary because it does not take into account this, uh, the intrinsic uh, shape of the, uh, of, the, of the coupling spectrum. So for example, you can invest more energy but actually get worse results because you, you do not invest your energy wisely. In the optimal modulation, you invest your energy and then you, you search for the, for the minima inside the, the spectrum in order to reduce this spectral overlap. So let's go to, to a closer look here. As you can see, for each minima in the, in the coupling spectrum, there is this maxima in the modulation spectrum and vice versa. So this results in the, in the minimization of the overlap, the spectral overlap between these two, and the minimization of the decoherence rate. And as you can see, the spectral, uh, the, the, the time domain of the modulation itself is non-trivial as well as it's a Fourier transform. 
So to conclude, uh, dynamical decoupling and bang-bang modulation and other types of modulation are usually environment insensitive. And when I'm saying that, it means that they ignore the coupling spectrum itself. They do not take this into account. The optimal modulation, which, I, which I've used, uh, chirps or changes the, the pulse shape in order to minimize the spectral overlap of the system bath coupling and the modulation spectrum. The current results, as I've showed you, which use the universal dynamical decoherence control formalism, because they use this universal formalism, they apply to both proper dephasing and the decay infinite temperature bath, and also to other uh, examples that I've showed. And we are working now on extensions to a multi part decoherence and disentanglement optimal control. So if you, have, uh, you want to preserve entanglement, you want to do it in the optimal control, uh, uh, in the optimal way. The main conclusion is you must to, uh, know thy enemy, so you must know the, the noise or the spectrum of the of the module of the of the noise in order to optimally control it. Okay, thank you very much. Not, it's not so much as you see as you see in the frequency domain. Uh, it's not a, a okay. Let's go back. You see, there is some some still a, 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 a leeway here to to play with the the modulation. What I've actually done is a little bit more complicated than that. I've r I run the the optimal uh, the single equation for the optimization uh, until it converges, and then I also ran a linear. Uh, a, a, a linearization of the Euler Lagrange to search its surrounding. So wh while the, and the, the surrounding itself is, is very, very stable against these uh, small, small changes in the modulation. So uh, a, a, all, the, all the optimization is in the time domain. The frequency domain is simply just for understanding what's going on. Usually when you do optimization, you do optimization, you get this really, really complicated post and you don't know why, why is it the best one. The point is here is that in the frequency domain, you really understand why this is optimal because it it's exactly matches the highs with the lows. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, uh, I haven't analyzed it fully, but as I understand, as I understand it, you want, you want to go to the higher and higher frequencies all the time. And here, I know it's confusing, but here, the higher the modulation, you go to the higher frequencies because you, it, you, you, what you have is a two-level system, and this is a, is a detuning, is, is how you change your frequencies, okay? How you change the two-level system. So the point is that the higher you're here, the, the higher you go to higher frequencies, higher frequencies here. So you want to go to higher and higher frequencies. So you, you do not want to go to the highest frequency and then stay, uh, stay to see a constant frequency, you always want to go higher and higher and higher. So this is some kind of uh, optimization on this going to higher and higher frequencies. That, that's how I see it. So, so the, the y -axis there is the frequency? It's, it's the AC Stark shift. Okay? okay. 